Sam Hawley, coming to you from the lands of the Gadigal people. This is ABC News Daily. The cyber attack on Optus was so unsophisticated, some analysts say a primary school student could have pulled it off. So how did the telco fail to protect the data of millions of its customers? Today, a cybersecurity expert on the overseas hacking gangs believed to be behind the breach. My name's Justin Warren. I'm Chair of Electronic Frontiers Australia and I run a consulting company that works with big technology, mostly with startups in the United States. Justin, this has been described as the biggest hack in Australian history, so it sounds like a pretty big deal. It does seem to be a pretty big deal, yes, Mm -hmm. given the reaction over the last few days. (laughs) The Home Affairs Minister, Claire O'Neill, she's certainly not impressed. We should not have a telecommunications provider in this country, which has effectively left the window open for data of this nature to be stolen. But she pointed out on 7.30 that this hack, this attack, wasn't sophisticated. Well, you certainly don't seem to be buying the line from Optus that this was a sophisticated attack. Well, it wasn't, so no. What does she mean by that? Uh, Look, sophisticated is a bit of a slippery word. Mm. Often companies would prefer that it's a sophisticated attack because that means that it's not a simple attack because that makes them look bad. Mm. Look, it might be sophisticated by the standards of a an Australian executive, but for a any technologist who has some fairly rudimentary programming skills, it's not sophisticated at all. Okay, so I want you to give me a bit more detail on that. I'm sure it'd be sophisticated for me, but just explain to me how easy it was for these hackers to get in and get this information of all these millions of customers? Sure. I do want to preface this by saying that uh, we don't know for sure. Mm. I'm going on the information that's been published by the extortionists. Mm -hmm. Um, They may be lying. Of course. (laughs) However, we haven't had um, any details from Optus about what actually went on. Now, based on that, what it looks like happened is that Optus built some kind of system that allows a remote computer to interrogate its customer database and pull out customer information. Now, there's probably a, re- a good reason for that. Um, some systems, for example, when you ring up the customer service person to complain about the data breach, they need to be able to look up your phone number and your name so that they can see your account and understand, do you have an account with us? Yes, you do. Now, there's other information that has been put next to that record or added to that record for things like identity documents. So driver licence number, passport number, it looks like possibly Medicare numbers. Like That system pulls back a huge amount of customer data, much of which it probably didn't need, and provides that to another computer. That system doesn't look like it's had much in the way of authentication controls, so... Normally, you would build one of these so that not anybody can query this interface and ask the computer, hey, can you give me information about any customer I ask for? So some of those controls were missing. Then it looks like the system was connected to some kind of test network potentially, and it looks like there was some misconfiguration that happened that exposed this uh, this endpoint, as it's called, this API endpoint, exposed that computer to the public internet where it was discoverable by pretty much anybody. Mm. And because there were no authentication controls, they could just from anywhere in the world talk to the computer and ask it to send it any given customer's identification. Mm, so hang on, these, having no authentication controls, is that a mistake from Optus or was it an oversight? I mean, how long were they missing? Um, it was an error, a mistake, a failure, negligence. There's a whole bunch of words that we could use. Um, it depends on some of the details of how this came to be. Certainly, it's not something that we would expect a company here in 2022 that has this much personal data mm. uh, in their systems it's something that they should definitely have had in place. Just tell me, you're a tech sort of guy. You're you're an expert in this. 
I mean, could you have hacked Optus? Is that how easy it would be for someone like you? Uh, look, if if it's true that they just put a computer um, endpoint onto the public internet with no authentication controls, um, yes, abs- it, it's trivial. Anybody could have. Mm. Um, you could have browsed it from your, your browser. All you needed to know was the address to look up. I sent a tweet out before we got this information from the, the extortionist, which was tongue-in-cheek, or so I thought, which was a two-line Python script that would uh, would have done basically what it looks like the extortionist did. So, yes, for, as I said, someone for someone with fairly rudimentary programming skills, it's trivial. Mm, so what's a Python script? Python is a programming language. Okay. It is very popular. It's commonly available. And this is the kind, it is just one language. You could use any language based on what we have. The kind of programming that children do in primary school mm. would have enabled them to get get access to this data. Wow. Okay. Well, the Optus CEO, Kelly Bayer Rosemarin, she's under a fair bit of pressure. I mean, she broke down when she was issuing an apology. Uh, obviously, I'm angry that there are people out there that want to do this to our customers. I'm disappointed that we couldn't have prevented it. Um, and I'm I'm very sorry and apologetic. It should not have happened. But she's told the ABC she can't actually comment on whether the attack was sophisticated or not because a police investigation is still underway. Look, I think most customers understand that we are not the villains and that we have not done anything deliberate to put any of our customers at risk. In fact, quite the contrary, we're doing everything we can to prevent that from happening. I'm sure that she has been told to say that. Mm. So tell me, Justin, where are these hackers? Oh, well, they could be anywhere. Mm. I mean, just pure population statistics tells us that it is unlikely that they're going to live in Australia. Again, based on the evidence that we have, it would suggest that they are um, not native English speakers or they're very good at pretending not to be native English speakers. Mm -hmm. Just based on where people live and where a lot of these crime gangs operate, um, it is likely that they are going to be somewhere probably in Europe and they're likely just professional hackers. Mm, So the hack itself wasn't sophisticated, but are the networks of hackers, these sort of gangs of hackers, are they sophisticated? Um, Yes, increasingly so. Uh, It's big business. Mm. Some of these ransomware gangs have service desks. Um, They work a day job. They they have shifts. Um, They answer support tickets. They operate a lot like you would, you know, what you see inside standard businesses. So that all grew up because it's big business. Like there's billions of dollars uh, gets paid to these gangs every year. Um, It's extremely lucrative and they've become more organised because of the amount of money that's involved. And they are after money, aren't they? We know that. They want a million dollars and what happens if they don't get it? The original request, I suppose, or or threat was that, yes, pay us this money or we'll sell it to other people. It'd be a Mm -hmm. pure financial motivation, which makes sense. They don't care about the actual what's inside this database, like they don't care about the individuals, they don't care about you or me, they just care that they've managed to grab something, this data, which is valuable and they can sell it. That has changed a little bit in that they, they, it seemed that they increased the pressure on Optus um, and were starting to release parts of the data. However, that does seem that they may have walked that back and they've issued an apology, Mm. it looks like, and said that they won't be releasing any more data. So that's the other side of the pressure. they have embarrassed a very large and politically well-connected company and now we have some uh, various agencies who are gunning for them. So they better be really good at hiding their tracks. What about this data, though? If they do sell it on, on sell it, what then can someone do with that? You know, these 2.8 million Australians, they've got passport numbers, driver's licences. What could someone do with that data? The most likely outcome will be boring old fraud. Mm. This information is useful to pretend to be you when you, if you were to, for example, ring up a bank and try to get a credit card or a bank loan in someone else's name. If you can provide 100 points of ID, then you could get credit and it won't be in your name. So you can go and spend all the money and when you don't pay it back, 
they won't go looking for the criminal, they'll go looking for you, mm. the person it was taken out. And that's really common. Um, that is the most likely situation for most people. However, for some people, they are at greater risk from other forms of harm. So, for example, if you moved away from an abusive ex-partner and they didn't know your address yet, if this data got out and it had your new address, maybe they could look it up and find you and know where you live now. Mm. So those are the kinds of um, real uh, pointy harms that are very specific to individual people that can flow on from this kind of breach. Sounds like from what you're saying there's been a real failing by Optus. Claire O'Neill points out that the laws here mean the government can fine Optus but not that much. Just over $2 million is the maximum fine under breaches of the Privacy Act. Totally inappropriate. So I think there's a few things that we're going to need to look at. What's it like in other countries? Well, in the EU, the General Data Protection Regulation provides for fines of, I think it's the greater of €20 million euro or I think it's 4% of global revenue for the previous year. So um, other jurisdictions take privacy a lot more seriously than we do here in Australia and have put in place um, regulations that try to at least create some disincentives for companies to collect too much data in the first place and then not store it properly. But then they also create some penalties for if it does happen, then at least the companies get fined, which is ideally to discourage them from doing it again. What we don't see generally around the place is enough done for individuals to be able to seek redress for the harm that they suffer. And that can just be something as boring as all the time that you have to spend now getting a new licence, getting credit checks lined up, making sure that you've got the watch and the, all the reports coming through so you're checking to see if anyone's trying to do fraud in your name. All of that, like there's expenses with those, but it's also just time. Mm. Sounds like from what you're saying there's been a real failing by Optus. Could this happen to other companies? Who's next? It could happen to anyone. And look, honestly, in information security, uh, the the thing to, the words to live by are when, not if. Mm. You need to be prepared for when you get attacked or when you have a data breach. Uh, it is very, very difficult to achieve perfection. So really, companies should think very, very carefully about any of the information that they collect and store. Don't collect it in the first place unless you absolutely need it and then don't keep it any longer than you absolutely need it. We really need companies to stop treating data as an asset and start treating it as a liability. Justin Warren is the chair of Electronic Frontiers Australia. Optus has offered a year subscription to a credit monitoring service to help customers identify suspicious financial activity. Chief Executive of Optus is vowing to stay in her job. She says if anything from the investigation indicates the telco had made an error, it will take full responsibility for it. This episode was produced by Flint Duxfield, Sydney Peed, and Chris Dengate, who also did the mix. Our supervising producer is Stephen Smiley. I'm Sam Hawley. ABC News Daily will be back again tomorrow. You can find all our episodes of the podcast on the ABC Listen app. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free.